Hello, everyone. Um, um, welcome to the session on pension decisions. Um, there'll be four talks. Each talk is 15 minutes long with five minutes for questions. If you're going to ask questions, please either put them in chat um, or um, raise your hand. I'd ask that anyone who asks questions keeps it short because um, that way we can have more questions. So maximum 30 seconds if you're asking questions. No long questions. And um, let's get going. The first talk um, is by Jurgo uh, Gusens, and it's about are risk preferences stable for impactful financial decisions. Jurgo. So thanks uh, for uh, inviting me and having me on the program. Uh, my name is Jorge Gosens and I present the paper co-authored with Marieke Knuff. Uh, I'm at Radboud University, Nijmegen, Tilburg University. Uh, and what's also important for this research is that I'm affiliated with the APG. This is All Pensions Group in the Netherlands. Um, and we use data from them, uh, which will become clear in a few minutes. So what do we study in this paper? Uh, we study basically whether risk preferences are consistent or uh, stated differently, stable across elicitation methods. Um, there's a so-called risk elicitation puzzle, which was uh, brought up by uh, Pedroni and their uh, co-authors in 2017. And why is this uh, question relevant? Well, uh, academically it's relevant because most of these risk elicitation puzzles have been studied in, in student samples, so to say, uh, and we take it to a sample with actual pension fund participants. Uh, and from a policy perspective, well, at least in the Netherlands, there's new legislation coming up, which prescribes that uh, pension funds must elicit the risk preferences um, of the pension members. Um, so that's a big task uh, that we at least have in the Netherlands now and is maybe also more common uh, already in uh, other uh, uh, countries, uh, especially in DC schemes. So what we know is that this observed heterogeneity in risk preferences across methods is rather large, but we don't know this from a pension uh, fund perspective. Uh, so in the pension domain, how do these risk preferences behave specifically and also specifically for impactful decisions? And what do I mean with impactful decisions? Well, the decisions that the pension fund members make in our survey, uh, the answers will be used to uh, 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 tailor uh, their investment decisions or specifically the asset allocation to the preferences of the participant. So that's what we mean with impactful. And eventually, we also uh, relate the risk preferences to real life outcomes and to see uh, where stability uh, correlates with social demographics. So what do we do? Uh, we estimate risk preferences using three different methods. They are listed here, the choice sequence method, the single choice list, and convex time budgets. And we do this for about 1,600 pension fund members in the construction uh, sector. What we also do is we use a, a classic questionnaire just with a wide background, a very standard setting to elicit the preferences. And we also developed a serious game trying to uh, 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 keep a higher attention span of uh, the individuals. That's uh, the first part of the paper. And then in the second part of the paper, we simulate risk preferences for virtual subjects. Um, and then we can study how these virtual subjects would behave if they go through our three elicitation methods. And then we can sort of uh, study um, how the elicitation methods impact uh, the, the risk preferences. And we can also study what happens if you make choices randomly, independently, or if you have some noise uh, in your own risk preference parameter, right? If I ask you, what is your uh, risk preference parameter? That's probably a hard question to ask. So there could be some noise uh, around this. And in the third part of the paper, we then uh, study the stability of the risk preferences across methods and related to uh, uh, background controls. So what do we find? And then you basically have the paper in a nutshell. So we confirm the risk elicitation uh, puzzle in the pension domain. Yeah, we find large uh, heterogeneity between the three methods uh, uh, in risk preferences at the individual level and also at the aggregate level. We find that uh, for those familiar with these uh, terms, the convex time budget method is superior in eliciting risk preferences if the, you have no noise in your risk preference 
measure so you exactly know your own risk preference uh, uh, curvature parameter and if there is no uh, random behavior. In case of some random behavior, the choice sequence method performs way better. In the third part of the paper, we then find um, that when preferences are unstable, that this typically holds for blue collar workers, older individuals, and lower income workers. So what do we do? A uh, bit more into the details, and I uh, have to apologize. This uh, uh, The next three slides contain some Dutch, but I'll guide you through it. So this is just to briefly show the elicitation methods. This is the choice sequence method. So what happens here, we ask the participant whether uh, she wants pension A or pension B. Pension A is uh, less risky than pension B. Yeah, In the good scenario for pension B, you get 3,270 euros. And in the uh, 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 worst case scenario, you uh, receive 2,050 euros. And then the simple question is to the participant, do you want pension A or pension B? Well, if you choose the more risky pension, say pension B, then you get a next question and then uh, uh, you uh, again give an answer, you get a next question, and we do this a couple of times to give an interval for your risk aversion parameter. The second method that we use, so this is a within subject design, is the single choice list method. So after participants have filled in the choice sequence, they uh, get this method, and this is just one question, set up almost identical to the choice sequence, but here we show four pensions simultaneously. Simple question here is, do you want pension A, pension B, pension C, or pension D? Pension A is for risk-averse individuals, and pension D is for risk-seeking individuals. And after that, we have an indication for your risk aversion parameter. The third method that's a bit more uh, involved, but this is the convex time budget method from Andreoni and Sprenger in 2012 uh, in the AER. Um, so the idea here is to elicit risk and time preferences simultaneously. Yeah. So we give the participants a budget of 10,000 euros, and then we ask them to distribute this 10,000 euros between one year from now and 10 years from now. And then option A, you would get 10,000 euros now and zero euros in 10 years. If you choose option B, you get 7,000 euros in one year and 3,000 euros in 10 years, etc. You make about six questions, and then we again have an indication of your risk preferences as well as time preferences. So these are the theoretical possibilities for the three elicitation methods. So we can see that the convex time budget method, these are the crosses, um, is very precise uh, at zero. And zero means that you are risk neutral, if your risk aversion parameter is lower than zero, you're risk seeking. If it is greater than zero, you're risk averse. The choice sequence method is also pretty precise, but a bit more coarse. And the single choice list method with the triangles only has four options. So it's super coarse, but is maybe cognitively easier to answer for the participants. So this is uh, the first main result of the paper. This is the confirmation of the risk elicitation puzzle. Yeah, so here you see the distribution uh, of the risk preferences for the three methods. So in blue for the choice sequence method, in red for the single choice list method, and um, in yellow, the convex time budgets. And um, the choice sequence method has a much wider uh, dispersion in uh, risk aversion values than, for example, the convex time budget method. So from a completely rational expected utility maximizing perspective, these three distributions should be equal, which is not the case. So then you can wonder, OK, do these uh, risk preferences make sense at all? So th what do we do? Very simple. As a dependent variable, we take the uh, risk preference outcomes and we regress them on some controls. And for all three methods, so in column one and two, we have the choice sequence. Column three and four, we have the single choice list. And column five and six, we have the convex time budgets. And the general takeaway is that when you're older, you're more risk averse. If your income is higher, or if you are a white collar worker, you're a bit more uh, risk tolerant, which is also in line with um, the literature. So the things that we elicit here at least seem to make sense.
So what do we do then? Um, the bars here show the observed risk aversion that we just elicited, all methods combined. We fit a normal distribution to this, and then we start making 10,000 draws from this normal fitted distribution. These 10,000 draws represent virtual subjects. And these virtual subjects, we are going to uh, put them virtually through our three elicitation methods, and then we are going to study the behavior of these uh, virtual subjects in the three methods. So if you exactly know your preferences, so you completely know the risk aversion parameter sort of that is on your forehead, then here in bold, the convex time budget method is most close to the true underlying risk aversion that is shown here in panel A. If there is some random choice behavior going on that's shown at the bottom of panel B, then the choice sequence method best matches in terms of levels um, the true underlying simulated risk aversion. Okay, given this information, we are now going to study the stability of risk preferences. So what do we say? We are going to say that, okay, if the risk aversion parameters of uh, the choice sequence method overlaps with the convex time budget method, you get one point. And if the convex time budget method overlaps with the other method, you get an additional point. Yeah, so we are going to make pairwise comparisons and we define preferences as being more stable as the risk aversion intervals overlap. overlap. Yeah, so if there's no overlap, you have very unstable preferences. And if all the three uh, uh, pairwise, pairwise comparisons overlap, you have very stable preferences. And then we arrive at this rather interesting picture. So here at the left upper corner, we see the observed stability. So for about 50% of the sample, only one of uh, only two methods overlap. And absolute stable preferences we find for about 70% of the sample. That's three out of three. What is rather interesting is that if the virtual subjects completely would know their own preferences, um, then it would be able, that's shown in the deterministic picture, uh, completely stable preferences, three out of three, yeah? So it is possible in our setup to reach completely stable preferences, but we don't find that, right? So the pictures that best match the observed stability uh, are the independent choices and the random choices here. What does this mean is that participants seem to make uh, an answer or a risk preference in method in the first method and then in the second method they come up with a completely independent risk preference and that have the same behavior in uh, the third method. So main takeaway here is that in line with the former literature that uh, risk preferences between the three methods seems to be completely independent. Well, we do all kinds of robustness checks. We also use other measures rather than only the overlapping intervals. We also use the root mean squared error, the mean absolute error, and the number of consistent choices. This is my last slide, Mike. Um, and um, all the results are similar. And what do we find as well here? That's the final takeaway that I want to give you is that when you're older, your preferences are less consistent. They are more unstable. Also, if your income is higher, then they are more stable. And if you're a white collar worker, your preferences are also more stable. Well, and with that, uh, I would like to conclude. So we study the risk elicitation puzzle in a pension fund setting in the pension domain. We confirm the risk elicitation puzzle. We find method specific behavior. And um, well, in line with the former literature, we find that preferences uh, are more stable if you are a young, a white collar worker and a high income. And for now, uh, that would be it. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Great. Okay. So let's move on to the next talk, which is um, actually presented by two people, Denise LaRose and Paulina Granado, so joining. And the subject is improving pension information, experimental evidence on learning using online resources. So um, Denise and Paulina, over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Paulina Granados and together with Denise, we are going to present our joint uh, research together with Charles Neusser, uh, uh, Gabriela Jardo, Jimena Quintanilla, Pedro Valente and Mauricio Lopez. 
I just wanted to highlight that this is a joint project between, between the Chilean pension regulator and the University of Arizona and University of Santiago. And I just wanted to tell that uh, these uh, joint efforts uh, are prove, have proven, at least in Chile, to have important policy implications to improve the well-being of pensioners, the pre-pensioners. This is our second uh, project. Second, uh, next slide. So uh, this is just to give you an idea of what uh, it was our initial point at this research. Uh, the main thing here is that going through the retirement process, deciding what to do with one's private pension and, uh, and, and what to decide, it's a one-shot uh, uh, decision. It's a high-stake decision. And it's made in a technical language that not many people understand. Not even, not even me that I'm working at the Superintendency of Pensions uh, the last uh, seven years. Okay, so this is the screenshot of what you see when you go through, um, when you go to see uh, information, to, to get uh, information about benefits, for example. And what can you see here is that internally in text, it has a structure, it's a structure in topics. Uh, the names you, uh, are in Spanish, but they're not very straightforward to follow. And also some of the links uh, guide you directly to the law. Okay, so it's very technical. Um, in the next slide, we see that uh, this is what we know, okay? So understanding then that the retirement process is indeed hard, it's, it's hard to understand. We know that financial literacy is low and is not deception in Chile, okay? We have research, uh, we have the uh, Landa Chan Martinez showed that in Chile it's, 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 it's the same than in, in the world. Also that choice archit uh, architecture of the website matters, okay? We know by heart that, but uh, uh, this is something that we are going to use uh, 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 in our uh, set experiment in here. And more importantly, I would say the model status quo website, if it's too loaded, it's diff it's more difficult, it conducts to inaction, yeah, that it's uh, known as the par paradox of choice. When we have too many choices, uh, it, it's more difficult we take a decision. So what we argue uh, is that there is too much information, it's too hard to process, and the, deci the, the, the decision you are taking is too important for your the, the later part of your life. It's evident also there is a cognitive overload. Uh, okay, we have too many, too many, too, too much information, and also something that we are exploring and that Denise is going to explain better uh, in the second part of the presentation is that there is an underlying emotional mechanism that can be impacting the experience. Okay, and we also wanted to get some insights about that. So our research question that we have in the next slide, it's, uh, is it possible to increase participant willingness to engage with pension information websites by changing the structure of the homepage? Okay, so we are, we, and we are, what we are going to do is to have it from product oriented, okay, so the topics, to a uh, profile oriented, Okay, so it's more uh, it's more uh, adequate to the person that is looking for the information, and also we are adding uh, or replacing or adding videos. Okay, to explain uh, difficult information. Um, so what we what we did it's uh, we have a two uh, times two uh, setting that yeah? okay so we are going to innovate in the way in, in the information structure so we are going to have web pages that are product oriented and profile oriented and in the information format also we are having to have text and videos okay and in what follows Denise will go deeper in 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 the design of the of the experiment. So what we, um, let me just show you because it's much easier if you see the differences, okay? So uh, we have this as a, our structure of our baseline um, information. It's very similar to what you saw in the first slide uh, regarding the, the uh, superintendency website. The only major difference is that we've included here some visual cues and we do this because we need to keep some consistency across treatments. And since we are adding videos and since videos have emotions and have colors and have a, a lot of other uh, attraction mechanisms, right? We, we included these cues. We hope it's not that different from our baseline, right? But the information is there, the content is there. We also worked a lot on the content and made content much easier from the person's perspective, right? And I'll show you this a little bit later in the results. So we changed from this structure to this structure. This is our profile oriented structures, right? And we did this for the public pension, right? So the public benefits that are available and 
we do we guide it through kind of who is eligible for the different um, benefits. So if you're healthy, oh sorry, um, if you've saved for things, I do. Sorry, I, I'm. We do this for both the public and the private. And so this slide is for the private pension benefits, right? We also do this for the public because we've included robustness tests to our design, which what we wanted to check is if the content mattered, if the length mattered, if the information. So it's like doing different variations to see the robustness of our strategy in terms of getting better results in financial literacy. This is what we did with the private. So this is defining people in terms of health and in and the amount of money that they've saved. This is our just video treatment. We just added videos to the original slide, or to the original homepage. And this is our full interactive mode, which has the videos plus the profiles. What you'd see, the content of the videos and the text was exactly the same, right? But we just used the script from the videos as the text. And what we've eliminated basically is the interaction, right? The, the mode in which people receive information. As I said, we do this in private and public for uh, for the interactions that the image, the original homepage images are very similar. They're just pertinent to kind of the public benefit schemes. And we do as a two by two, we act, evidently have eight designs. And we also do another robustness, which is do we do this online because we're interested in reactions of people that are aged 50 or above, right? But then you have a lot of externalities and things you can't control. So we also do this in the lab with students with fully randomized treatments and we have a face reader. So we're measuring emotions in the lab. And we've all done this in block randomization by gender because we, we know experiences and incomes and information in gender is very different. The experience and kind of pre, it, information that they have beforehand is different, right? So we think both of these is going to change both engagement, so just the willingness to scroll through the websites to access information, to engage with information. We thought this was going to affect correct responses, so people were going to learn more, especially from the videos and the treatment. Uh, we thought this would also help with the changes, the innovations, with how people self-reported their evaluations of the websites, so if they had a better user experience. Um, we did not think there was going to be any social demographic heterogeneity. We had, didn't have a hypothesis ex ante, but we did incorporate randomization protocols that would allow us to check for this heterogeneity. And uh, at the exploratory level, we wanted to see the the effects on the emotional side of uh, of the interaction. So, what you're going to see are regression tables. We're going to see the full impact for profile. You no, know, the main impact for video and then the interactive effect of seeing the profile and the video. And we have a couple of controls. None of this is, this is all balanced. So it doesn't really matter if you have controls or not. We first check for attrition. So this is our online sample. And in the online sample, people could log off. They could get lost at some point, right? Because we did this in, in multiple stages. So people had a survey and then they logged onto the website and then they had to complete another service. And we could lose people and we wanted to check if there was any heterogeneity in this loss. Um, we don't find anything. Basically what you see here is that nothing is statistically significant and this model, especially here is even, it's there's nothing that you can test because uh, people who opted in based uh, into kind of looking through the entire website and answering incentivized uh, an incentivized questionnaire didn't change by profile or product or video, right? We got a lot of engagement. Most people stayed on the website. We thought this was going to be different. We thought just changing the homepage, like making the questions, the choice architecture simpler was going to get more people to engage with the information, but we don't have any evidence of that. The good side of that is that statistics are cleaner. We have no attrition, right? So the sample that we end up with is fairly representative of like a highly educated population. Women, men is relatively equal split. People have gotten also more interest in the, in the private um, in, uh, pension side than in the public benefits, but we still have enough sample and all of that. Uh, financial literacy is not very high. This is a four point scale, a, a four point scale and um, this is two points on this scale. It's 50% is this 
people answering either one question out of three correctly. And so it doesn't work very well. Um, it just says that our underlying financial literacy level is relatively low. It is high, highly representative, like 30% of university um, postgraduate, sorry, 50% postgraduate and graduate. Um, which means that it is a population that is in the private pension scheme that has more access. They are financially a higher income than the general population, right? But it is also the people that have money in, in the private scheme. So that was important for our models. Um, we do balance tests and we don't find anything. So I'm going to skip that. And these are our main regressions. This is very, very simple to understand. This line is the video line, right? It has stars in all the lines and the effects go from about um, rel close to one point extra, right? Which means that um, which means that everybody's learning. It doesn't matter if you're on the online sample, on the private, in the public, in the men, in the women, if you don't know anything, Exante, everybody's learning. This was seven points, so seven questions, and they were the average is going up at about one question, right? And then we start with 4.5 out of seven, which is not too bad of a midpoint to start with, right? So we are increasing from that midpoint upwards. We do this in the lab with students and we get the same results. So it's not about age. It's not about how much uh, knowledge you have beforehand. It's not about how much interest you have in the pension system, right? The results here is that the videos are really driving people to learn more and when they're logging on online and when they're accessing information, right? We do some heterogeneity tests with um, BART models. So these are Bayesian uh, random forest models that we don't really find any difference. If we find some difference is that in the harder stakes, so in, for when information is about the private pension schemes, then um, you're learning a little bit more, both in the lab and online. This is also the harder part. This is, this is websites that have about double the amount of information on them. So getting people to learn more about it is harder overall. And is very important because as we talked about before, right? you have a lot of choices now because you can tailor your pension. And so we really need those people to understand what they're choosing and when when they're doing this process. So that's very is a very good result. We don't find a lot of differences. So people liked both all of our websites uh, pretty similarly, both in the lab and online. These are net promoter scores. If you've ever seen them, these are very, very high. Anything above zero is good, right? And these are close to 30 in the 30s and 40s with this just um, extremely high and rare in terms uh, of like user interaction. So we were very glad about this. As I said, we put in a lot of effort and a lot of time working with people, you know, from the side of literature, right, from from the pension superintendency and from the academics perspective to, to make the information easy and accessible. And we're on that track now. We want to kind of working on different types of communications. And in emotions, as I said, we, we did this exploratory. We didn't really know what we were going to find. Um, but one thing that uh, that has come up is that when people saw the profiles, right, which didn't do very well, I mean, they, they don't increase comprehension. We don't find any positive evidence towards them. So when they saw the profiles, and especially in combination with the videos, we they we lost their concentration. They were very concentrated, right? They they were interacting. You typically have like this frown on your face type of situation where you're paying attention. And when we changed the this homepage, we're losing them in terms of kind of that effort. And so uh, this is is a warning towards designing new pages and doing changes that could be very attractive or can be going on in, in other types of areas or like NGOs. It doesn't always work in the direction that that one would expect. So we, we have to be very careful about not uh, not losing kind of the trust people have in the way that in, by the way the information is provided. Right? And so this is our general discussion, which is basically that right videos are working, 
use them. They're very useful. They're not that expensive to do. Put in, put in effort into that. Changing websites, there's not a lot of evidence towards it. It's very expensive. So I, I wouldn't be suggesting it any soon. And thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Okay, so now it's time to move on to the third talk. We're, um, we're at the halfway mark, it's half time. Um, and Peter Verhallen is gonna talk about friends with benefits, strengthening PRFX through aligning reference group attributes to consumer traits. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mike. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I know we're all across uh, the world. So um, happy to chat about uh, friends with benefits. You know, it sounds maybe like, ooh, fun. Uh, but you know, it, it, it's really adding on that last uh, talk about how do we improve on communication, right? So the overall topic here is friendship communication. How can we uh, get people to engage better? This is uh, joint work with um, Thomas Post, uh, Lisa Bruggen, Gabor Kerke Schröder from Maastricht University. And we actually started this research when I was at Maastricht University. I'm now at NC State in the United States. Um, and also this is uh, um, yeah, greatly funded by, uh, by Netspar, this, uh, this research. So thank you for uh, for inviting me to uh, to discuss uh, um, yeah this research project. So first, a little virtual uh, raise of hands. Um, who has uh, engaged with their uh, retirement uh, savings plan in the last two months? And I'm expecting a lot of hands here. So uh, if I'm not seeing any hands, I know you're not paying attention. <laughs> okay, so I see some virtual some some physically raised. Thank you. Um, and the idea is really okay. Now, if you if if you are seeing that right, you're looking at the screen right, and you're seeing people raise their hands. You're thinking, wow, okay, um, we're talking about pensions. Uh, I should really be doing this too. And if you're not doing it right now, maybe you're inclined to change your behavior. Uh, maybe based on certain characteristics that these people have. That's over. That's basically the topic of this uh, this talk. And and the goal is really to increase uh, retirement engagement. And um, and the reason being behind that is. Let me just move the pictures here, they're kind of blocking. Sorry. Okay. And the reason is that, you know, we see that, uh, and we, of course, all know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, retirement engagement, uh, there, there's, there is uh, room for improvement uh, in the US. You know, uh, there's some evidence people spend more time uh, buying a, a new TV than on their retirement uh, planning. Um, in the Netherlands, when we think in terms of replacement rates, people are, are not necessarily uh, hitting that, that, that milestone. So saving too little in, the, in America, you know, there's evidence that quite a few people, they lack uh, pension uh, savings and, and the readiness, the, the, the perception of being ready for pension is decreasing. Last year, that was 22%, the year before that, 24. So there's a decline happening. Um, and, and, and really the idea is, well, um, we can use nudges you know, through communication to, to, to get people more engaged as kind of a grassroots way to get them better uh, prepared for, for their pensions. Um, and then for this, this research project really adds to the body of knowledge on uh, social norm interventions as a use of, uh, of nudges. And so what does that mean? Just to make sure we're all on the same page here, uh, when we talk about, when I talk, when our co you know, when we talk about a social norm, we're talking about sets of beliefs about what others are doing or what they approve of doing, right? So it's about an objective measure, like a descriptive norm or injunctive norm of what people approve of doing. When we talk about a peer effect, it's a change of behavior in response to an activated social norm. And I just want to highlight here that, you know, when we talk about peer effects, we often think about peers. A peer effect is really social, you know, broadly speaking, it's a response to, to behavior, to a social norm that has been activated, right? It could be a social norm from a group that is not your peers, but in your, your um, behavior changes in re response to that, but we try to still consider that a peer effect. And then a social norm intervention is activating a social norm, basically, by presenting information about what a particular group, so a particular behavior of a particular group, right? And a common example is, uh, for those of you that are in Australia right now, but I'm assuming we're all calling in from everywhere else. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the hotel example that um, uh, people in this hotel room or in this hotel, they reuse their towels, right? That's a descriptive norm. And it has been shown, of course, to, uh, to change behavior that people now start reusing their towels. And this is, you know, an intervention approach that works quite well for reducing binge drinking, even for, um, for recycling, for littering, for voting behavior across the board, quite effective. But... And this is kind of the motivation of this research is, okay, so it's effective for many, but not all, the you know, most of the time, but not always, not for everybody, right? We need to address that with an idea. I think that's a big, big uh, puzzle that, that we're all working on within communication uh, is, is really um, looking at, at, at these great intervention approaches, but then trying to identify well, for whom do, don't they work? Why not? How can we make them even better? And so uh, we see in a financial decision-making context, especially in a retirement context, 
um, some mixed results. We see results with social norm interventions that sometimes um, they're not effective, sometimes they're a bit effective. Sometimes they have an oppositional reaction. If people, they get exposed to information about what others are doing and they move away from that and they actually perform, let's say, more poorly than what the intervention is trying to achieve. And so why these mixed results, right? Could be communication channel characteristics. I think that last talk really went into that a little bit, right? Uh, one particular communication channel, let's say a website, um, many design elements to it could be more noisy, right? Norm might not be, in the social norm context, the norm might not be salient, right? Or there might be a general idea that's salient. It could be norm type related, descriptive or injunctive, could be consumer traits related. We are different on various traits, of course. Um, our susceptibility to influence, the information influence, as well as normative influence. We have a measurement scale for that that differs between individuals. Um, reference group characteristics could be different, right? The reference group that you're being exposed to, you might identify with them, you might be similar to them. The size might be larger, right? If you, if you find out that everybody's doing something versus two people are doing it, well, maybe if everyone's doing it, uh, there's some knowledgeable people among them and they know what they're doing, right? There might be some value in that. Trust is important, et cetera. And then reference group behavior could be it, right? It could be relative uh, position that's impacting your behavior, the magnitude of the difference, also very interesting research that I'm doing on, on that area and in a different project, um, or decision characteristics, right? Uh, uncertainty can, can certainly moderate the, the effectiveness. What we do in this project is we focus specifically on consumer traits, reference group characteristics, and the idea is, can we align them? We've got research in consumer traits, we've got research in reference group characteristics. Is there, you know, should we be aligning uh, some of this into a bigger, a bigger framework? And that's kind of what we, what we do. So the question then is, you know, can we align certain, uh, let's say, reference group characteristics, make them salient, um, you know, in light of certain consumer traits that we have and that heterogeneity of consumers to increase the power of the peer effect. And so let's start talking real quick about the consumer traits that we look at, and we look at the ones that are, you know, very uh, important for social norm influence. When we talk about, you know, normative influence and information influence, um, we as consumers, we have these goals of affiliation and accuracy, right? We some some of us want to affiliate more, some of us a bit less with uh, with other groups. Um, that's the idea that you know you might uh, adjust your behavior towards that of a group because you don't want you want to avoid punishment or perceived punishment. You want to uh, get rewards, or you might just want to um, to match your your own identity, right? That you feel a part of that group, you want to feel affiliated. And the goal of accuracy is really that normal that the information influence of we want some some of us want to make more accurate decisions than others, right? But we we differ in our goal of accuracy. But uh, basically, the idea is that we want to make accurate decisions, and the more so the more value we might find if, if other people are doing it, maybe they know something that we don't, right? So there's this informational influence. Now, in light of those characteristics, we thought, well, what reference group characteristics might play into those uh, consumer characteristics? And we looked first at social identification. Now we know social identification. So social identification is a subjective measure, right? It's, it's not similarity, it's perceived similarity, which makes it a better, in, in our opinion, a better metric for uh, similarity because you know somebody grows up in a wealthy uh, lifestyle, in in um, and then and then is down on their luck, right? Objectively speaking, if we're looking at demographics and other figures, we might think, okay, well, an individual is in a lower socioeconomic status, but they actually identify with a different group than that, right? So identification is in that sense more subjective, um, and has and has evidence that that um, the higher the level of social identification with the reference group, the higher the conformity to norms on average, right? On average, and um, and then social credibility quite similar, also. So credibility is a measure of uh, trust and expertise. So if the if a source that the message is coming from, and, and that's the same as the reference group, if the credibility of a reference group, and we, we use the measure then of source credibility, um, if that is, is higher, then there's a higher perceived validity of information. Um, and on average, that leads also to, to confirm conformity of accepting that information. So on average, these these characteristics, they, they seem to be positive. Um, and then we, we kind of think, okay, well, should, could social identification be contingent on, on people's goal of affiliation? And could the effect of social credibility on the peer effect be contingent on a uh, consumer's goal of accuracy, right? That, that's what we look at in our, in our project. So what do we do? So we, we had three phases. Phase one, we want to make sure we know exactly uh, which reference group is going to trigger a high or a low different levels of social identification, as well as high, low different levels of social credibility towards a broad set of consumers. So that's what we did in phase one. We worked with a pension uh, fund in the Netherlands um, to, with a representative sample, and I'll go into more detail in a second, 
to identify that. And once we know what reference groups will drive social education and social credibility, we um, use that to create interventions. Phase two, we do that in a lab and online. And for the sake of time, I will not go too much detail for that one in this uh, talk. And then phase three, and I think these are the great results, we implement that in the field with the two, more than 220,000 uh, pension fund participants with some, uh, some, some awesome results, I believe. So, so phase one, how do we go about identifying um, this, this source credibility and such? So we partner with a, this pension fund with 50,000 mailings. Um, I just want to highlight, you know, for those that are not that familiar with the choice based uh, conjoint experiment, you know, usually you're, you're selecting uh, products um, with varying uh, different, di varying um, attributes and varying levels, randomly varying attributes within those, um, sorry, levels within those attributes. In our case, this is Dutch, so apologize for that, but just, you know, visual image to get the, the idea. We, we looked at various demographics that we could match to the, the administrative data that we had from the pension fund, right, um, from their um, 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 database. And what we did was we, we randomized uh, different levels of these attributes um, and, and then looked at, okay, well, and then made, made, these, oops, made these different uh, profiles and we saw, okay, select the one with which you most identify that was based on an original um, measurement instrument for certification. And then for source credibility, we had a similar. So these were separate uh, 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 queries to the consumers. And you, by selecting many different sets of, of profile from many different sets of profiles, we can identify which attribute is most important and which level within the attribute is most important. And so in terms of attribute, we found that age is most important. So here you have the relative importance of reference group attributes on, um, on, 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 on let's say, social application as well as source credibility. And we see that uh, for both, age is the highest, right? So you think, okay, well, age seems to be a characteristic of a reference group that we should utilize to trigger social application and or source credibility, right? That's kind of the takeaway here. Now, when we look at the levels, we see that, um, and I know there's a lot of data here, but the top left, you have the, let's say, impact on social application um, of a specific age group on consumers of a specific age group. So if you see here, the age range of, um, let's say here, of the subject in years, 18 to 25, that's the blue line, the navy blue line, you can see that it's highest if you're using a reference group of the same age, and then that social identification goes down, that impact, right? And we see that same peak at the same age level across age categories, right? Now for source credibility, it's a little different. We see here that it goes up and it's, a, it's about one to two age range groups higher. So the reference group of one or two age groups higher gives the higher source credibility um, for, for younger individuals. And then 46 years and older, the same age triggers the highest source credibility. Okay, so now we know age seems to be very important, but it's a different age group that triggers certification and social credibility unless you're older than 46 years old. Okay, so in phase two, we, we kind of converted this and we, um, and I quickly go over the, the findings. We, we, we did some interventions in the lab and such, and we wanted to then also measure consumer uh, traits and then saw, you know, is it condition, is um, higher social, does higher, sorry, a reference group with higher social identification lead to a stronger peer effect? Only if the goal of, let's say, affiliation is higher. For, uh, for the goal of affiliation, we did need find this uh, to be the case. For the uh, goal of accuracy, we did not find a peer effect between groups, but we did find within the group where um, we had the uh, conditions of high source credibility, uh, we saw that um, there was a significant difference in behavior between the individuals low and high on their goals of accuracy. And um, so at least some indicative evidence that that is indeed uh, the case. Um, but in the field, so we were running shortly after that uh, field experiment. This is what I'm most excited about, and I'll, I'll round up on this. Um, we partnered with Big Pension Fund, 220,000 more mailings. What we did was we did a between subjects design where we used H um, uh, to, to trigger, uh, you know, to drive higher certification and high source credibility. So we wanted high low groups of, of these uh, um, conditions. Um, and I, I can get, talk more. I know I'm running low in time, so I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, in the QA if needed on the design. But uh, straight to the results here. So here we have the, the means of, of um, the click-through rate of an important, uh, let's say, a retirement engagement uh, behavior that we measured in the field. And, um, and what you see here, the subject age is on, on the left column. We have the condition. We, we target it uh, within age group categories because we know that um, engagement between age groups already differs. And we also tested this in the control condition. And so we, we target it within the age group because um, we wanted to, of course, use age to trigger different levels of social and source, and source credibility. 
Um, and here we have the delta on the right, the change from the control condition and the change from a generic peer condition. And the generic peer condition is a condition we use uh, that's currently used in industry a lot, which is more a gen general peer effect condition where everyone, all of your peers from that company or something are doing X, Y, Z, and that information is, is, is you know, used to try and trigger a behavior change. So uh, generic peer condition, we see no significant difference from the control condition. Right, so that's the first interesting finding is that uh, if you do the industry standard, uh, there would not have been any behavior change effect. Now, when we use our, our more tailored conditions, we see that indeed high social education conditions, you know, if we compare a high SI and high SC, SC is social credibility, SI is social education. If you compare that to the low and high condition here, um, we see significant difference. Of course, we see only a significant effect by the uh, high social education condition. We see that across the board. A very strong, strong peer effect. What we also interestingly find is an oppositional effect with low social notification, right? We were looking for this, but this uh, we, we found. So that's kind of a, an explanation for the, the oppositional um, uh, reactions that have been found. And um, you can see that uh, here under uh, point four. Now, uh, so it's credibility. We see a bit of an indication that uh, high, um, you know, if we have two conditions with high so social notification, the condition with high source credibility, has a significant difference, unfortunately not for uh, for the low social uh, source credibility. So there's some evidence there too. Um, we also measure different attributes because we measured the relative importance using this conjoint analysis in phase one. And we know that it doesn't uh, necessarily say the absolute difference in importance. So we wanted to see if we take a relatively less important attribute that is also high on social education source credibility, will there be a big difference between a less uh, important, um, relative important attributes with the same uh, characteristics, and we don't see a significant difference between them. Okay, so final takeaway. Um, so we, we try to align the normative and the informational channels of influence in terms of consumer traits and in terms of reference group characteristics. And we find evidence uh, that indeed social identification is conditional susceptibility to normative influence, oops, or normative uh, channel influence. Um, some in evidence that there, there might mainly be a, a, that, that a role of source credibility uh, for those uh, sensitive to informational um, and the generic peer group is ineffective. So um, that's a, the main takeaway. I'm happy to take questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Peter. So, um, so Charles Lung is going to talk about quantifying the insurance effects of Japanese social insurance policies and household structures. Again, 15 minutes, five minutes okay. for questions. Last session. Okay. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present and this joint work with David and uh, Sumita Sensei. And uh, like Peter, I want to say good, good morning, good afternoon, good uh, evening. It depends on uh, where you are. Um, so what we try to do is to think about uh, pension in a, a little bit bigger framework is to think about the different possibility of providing some form of social insurance. And then in that context, we ask the question, you know, which way is the so-called best way or, or better way or more important way in uh, providing social insurance in the context of Japan? So. Um, you, you probably see a picture like that uh, or, you know, similar report that, you know, in Japan, um, the uh, expenditure on these social security and uh, similar uh, um, expense relative to GDP is actually increasing. And then uh, Japan has a problem of about, you know, these uh, population aging, even Elon Musk has a twist and, you know, all, all these things. Uh, given the time, I, I probably skip that. Um, so there's uh, a lot of literature talk about that. So what we uh, what we try to contribute um, in this literature is to put all three. I mean, usually is um, each paper study a program, uh, whether it's um, a progressive tax or pension or whatever, um, separately. What we try to do is to build a model that we can put all three programs together, and then we try to force them model to match the data and then based on that model we, we try to make some um, uh, decomposition and some kind of uh, counterfactual exercise so um, this is a gene equilibrium heterogeneous agent and then we have the life cycle effect so it would um, I, I hope later we'll get back to uh, something what uh, Peter just said and it is incomplete market so so therefore you don't have uh, perfect insurance and then we uh, look at the uh, case of Japan um, so uh, I repeat, you know, we have progressive income tax. So um, so when you have very high income, we tax a bigger fraction of your income, right? When you have low income, we tax less fraction or even give you some rebate. And then we have the healthcare insurance and then we have the pension uh, system. 
Um, just in case you need to go, so the progressive tax system turns out to be uh, the most effective way in terms of smoothing the household income risk and provide the highest uh, welfare uh, value. Um, so uh, we use a data set, um, it's a Japan uh, panel data set. It uh, begin with uh, in 2004 and then start with something like 4,000 household. And so, so the good thing is, you know, I, I mean, of course it's not as big as PSID or whatever, but, but it, it at least help us to uh, provide some, you know, track over time and then we can take away the uh, individual fixed effect and so on. Um, it, it have you know the standard uh, information because you know um, um, it's a Masao Ogaki. Some of you may know him. Uh, Masao actually uh, part of it uh, in the design of this thing, and Masao has done a lot on the PSID. Okay, so um, uh, because of my time constraint, so I, I will just verbally describe this uh, overlapping generation model. I assume. Uh, you start 20, age 25, retire 65, maximum age is 99. Uh, around 60% are married. Uh, in this model, we don't have endogenous marriage choice. So you have your exogenous marriage or exogenous divorce or exogenous single accidental um, request. Utility function is kind of standard. Uh, we impose female to have uh, some uh, fixed time course in terms of working that would um, help us to generate the uh, labor market participation rate um, uh, difference between um, male and female. And then uh, uh, we also assume people will invest in the medical expenditure so that to uh, improve the health. And then we have uh, different uh, uh, pension, health, and, and so on. Um, you know, uh, we, we try to uh, put in parameters so that we can mimic the gender gap mimic the survival probability, mimic the labor force uh, participation thing. Uh, repeat, we have three kinds of risk. You have the mortality risk, you have idiosyncratic earning risk. So, so people at the same age could have very different income. And then you also have health risk. So, your, so we think of the health is like a capital stock. So you can suddenly have a negative shock. And so your health goes down. When your health goes down, then you have a choice whether you want to invest more on your health or you you just gamble uh, with, with your life, right? Like like some earlier paper say. Um, and then of course you can provide some uh, uh, insurance when you are married. It it kind of automatically has an insurance, and then uh, you can also have insurance through your own saving. And of course the pension is the public uh, part of it. Um, I, I need to skip all these family equations. And and at the end we need to uh, make sure all market clear you know, and, and so on. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time to do all these calibration, but I, I don't have time to explain any of that. Um, so uh, we, we also track the health transition process. So uh, what, what you can see very quickly is that um, the uh, persistence uh, is pretty high, except when you are in very bad uh, shape. So. So uh, JHPS actually asked people about the, the health so, so we can uh, use this transition matrix. Um, so with tons of things, so, so this is the uh, target moment. So I think we do a pretty good job in terms of, you know, this is data value, this is model fit. Um, partic um, in particular here is the average uh, participation rate, average hours of work. And then later on, we'll show you how the life cycle things going on, right? Because we just try to match the average, there's no guarantee we will actually match the life cycle pattern. Um, so this is what we have. So in terms of well, the model over predict a little bit. Um, income, we all first over predict and then, uh, and then under predict. Uh, the survival rate uh, for both gender turns out to be very good. And so I think it's a good model to think about medical thing. Um, so this is the health status, that's the medical expenditure. It's like we, we, we miss a constant somewhere. Um, and then this is the life cycle, um, uh, you know, labor market participation rate. So, so you can see for single female, we match very well. The married female is a little bit tricky. We, we, we try, but we, we haven't been very successful. Um, partly probably relate to pregnancy or something. Okay. Um, 
And then we also can me measure the consumption uh, inequality, but this is not what I try to say. So this is about the uh, so-called consumption insurance. Um, we didn't invent it, we, we totally pick it up from the literature. So the idea is we look at the uh, consumption change and then look at the income change and then think, up, and then think about uh, what is the correlation. Um, so if B is equal to zero, we, we say you have perfect insurance. When B equal to one, then we, we say that you have no insurance. And then, um, but the data typically say B is, you know, kind of in between. So one minus B actually measures the degree of insurance um, in the model. So one thing you can see is that, you know, based on all the estimation we have, we find that actually uh, first, you know, married people have, a bit more uh, consumption insurance. Second is, you know, over life cycle, right? Your your consumption insurance actually getting higher and higher, right? So so that's very important. We we will get back to that. That's important for our policy implication. So um, you know, uh, of course. Uh, so what we do is first we put in all three uh, system pick the parameter so that we match the Japan data, and then we do a nonlinear decomposition. First, we take away the pension, keep the other two, or we take away the health insurance, uh, keep the other two, or we take away the progressive tax and uh, keep the other two. And then of course it changed a lot of things, but I, I also only want you to focus the last two columns. CEV is the consumption equivalent measure about you know, how much welfare loss you, you will have. It turns out that taking away the progressive tax, I mean, we, we don't love tax, right? But it turns out that um, uh, from the society point of view, actually lost uh, most when we take away the progressive tax. And then also in terms of the insurance is also the, the, the source. You, we, you see that if you take away the pension, like you're losing like 2%. But if you take away the progressive tax, you lose something like 6%, almost three times of the pension. Okay, so, so this is the idea is, you know, when you shift, uh, when you take away the uh, public insurance, you force people to self-insure. When you force people to self-insure, they work more and then you stimulate the GDP, right? So, so it's good in those GDP figure, but you actually reduce consumption, force people to save more, and then actually it's bad for the welfare. So, so it's very important that the government should not be GDP focused. Okay, and then, um, um, so, so this is what, what we try to do is, this is the loss in insurance, right? So this is the overall, and then we can decompose whether it's single and for uh, married people. So uh, this blue bar is for when you take away the pension, this is when you have the health uh, insurance, this is for the progressive tax. So you can see that the single is hurt most, right? Because the mar marriage are kind of providing you an insurance somehow. Okay, um, then, uh, oh, sorry. The, uh, this is the wage profile. So, so what, what, what we uh, find is this is the insurance is most pronounced in the early stage of life, right? Because over time you start to accumulate asset, right? So uh, because you have precautionary uh, motive and then you have life cycle motive. So, so this is somehow consistent with Peter, but maybe with a, with a different interpretation. Uh, you, you tend to be, I mean, it's natural for, for people of your same age um, to be your reference point because you know um, uh, the, the insurance effect is somehow related to the uh, life cycle. So what was the implication? Well, you you know I, I think a lot of the pension conference we we say you know we need to protect the, the uh, old people, but but our model seems to suggest that we actually should think about the young people because they don't have enough asset to self insure. Second is about the female labor supply. I think um, you know many people have talked about the female labor supply. I don't repeat it here. Um, and then the the uh, first thing is about the long term saving. So or the other way is so called the saving commitment and all these things. So it turns it it, it may be uh, very incentive, uh, very important to to provide uh, incentive. And then the fourth thing is something I don't agree with my co-author, we're still trying to work on it is, you know, um, a progressive tax is, is good in, in our model, but the, in our model, we, we have a um, kind of exogenous growth uh, system. 
But what if the growth uh, more uh, is endogenous? So, so this is uh, Taiwan's the, the next step. So next step is, you know, we, we want to think more carefully about the health shock for the retirees. We want to measure uh, more about the insurance impact of the entire um, retirees. Uh, in this paper, we, we kind of take a life cycle perspective. Um, and then uh, we also want to study how the demographic change, like aging, declining marriage rate, and, and all these things, how would it can affect the uh, policy parameters. Should should the op would the optimal policy can adjust accordingly and and so on. And then lastly is the trade off between the insurance you know provided by the progressive tax and the endogenous growth. Because if your if your tax is too uh, progressive, maybe people would be lazy. Um, uh, they don't innovate, and then you lose the economic growth. So so that's the uh, what we learn. Um, Thank you. Okay, so it's now time for questions. Um, and we have a little bit more time um, for questions. We have six minutes. Um, first question. Any questions? Um, well, I guess I can ask a question um, in the absence of other questions. Um, in terms of the welfare effects, what do we know about the variance? So I, I saw the mean effects, but I was was really interested in the variability too. Yeah, I think the the variance is um, uh, kind of tough to present. I mean, we we have the data, but but uh, we 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 don't know how to present it. Um, so I, I I guess the next step is you know we 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 should. Um, we should provide some statistics about the the, the like the variance or, or the distribution of the uh, of the welfare effect. Um, so we, we we will do it uh, next in the next draft. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate all the speakers um, participating. Anyone who asked questions, thank you. Anyone who listened, thank you.